Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Man, it's been a good morning so far. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. If you have your Bibles or your apps, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. But before we get back to that passage, I've got a question for you. What makes you angry? What makes you angry? I know that possibility that some of you this last Tuesday night were angry if you were watching news. Maybe yesterday you were watching college football and after that game you may have been angry. You see, I wanna say this about anger. Anger is the result of not getting what we want. I know that may not be intuitive to you and you may not agree with that right off the bat, so let me say it again. Anger is the result of not getting what you want. So last Tuesday night, you may not have got what you want, so you got mad. Yesterday, you may not have got what you wanted, so you got mad. You see, anger at the very core is the result of not getting what you want. And what you want may include what you think you deserve, right? Because after all, who doesn't want what they think they deserve? Amen? See, think about it. Think about a time when you were really angry. I mean, couldn't you boil it down to simply this? The reason you were angry is you didn't get what you wanted. I know for me, having children from the very early days of having kids, uh, you wanna make a kid angry, take something away from them, right? And we laugh about that kind of uncomfortably over here. Y'all are not laughing, so y'all are more mature. That's what happens as adults, isn't it? If you really want to boil it down, you didn't get what you were convinced you were deserved of. Because somebody owes you, right? We're, we're, we, we all know those folks in our lives that have these statements. Maybe you've heard these. Uh, they took my reputation. They took something from me. How about this one? You stole my family. You took the best years of my life. You stole my first marriage. You robbed me of my teenage years. You robbed me of my purity. You owe me a raise. Or I love this one. You owe me an opportunity to try. You owe me an opportunity to let me go out, let me hang out with my friends. I never hear that at home. You owe me a second chance. You owe me affection. And again, here's the point. The root of anger is the perception that something has been taken, something that is owed to you and I. And then it creates this debt to debtor relationship. In Romans chapter 12, we started last week and we started working through that. And if you remember last week, I said that every one of us are a part of a bigger picture and what we do in our individual lives doesn't just affect us because every one of us have what we call this margin in our life. And maybe I'm being kind with you to call it margin. I'm being kind to me to call it margin because really what it boils down to is sin. We all have sin in our life. And we think that this little margin doesn't matter, but the problem is, as we learned last week in Romans chapter 12, is that if you take all the margin that is involved in all of our lives, and see, we know this to be true in our, in our businesses, we know this to be true on teams, we know this to be true in almost every other arena of life, but when it comes to the church, we sometimes forget that those little things and margins, if we add all of that up, what we get is we get a whole lot of margin in the group as a whole. That when people look at us, they don't see the individual, they see the whole of the group. 
And so Paul, last week, when we were looking at that, he, he kind of just, he moves from chapters 1 through 11. If you remember, I told you last week, chapters 1 through 11 is all theology. It's all about what God has done for us. And then Paul makes a shift in chapter 12 to move from theology to ethics, from theology to behavior, from theology to obedience. Yeah, I know. If you remember last week, one of the first things Paul said is that we should love each other without hypocrisy. That we should love each other without hypocrisy. And what I love what Paul did, and it almost seems too simple when you think that Paul summed up chapters 1 through 11. He took all that great theology and he summed it up in view of God's mercy. He took 11 chapters and he said, in view of God's mercies, he described chapters one through 11, mercy. God was merciful. God did something for us that we didn't deserve. God took a pitiful, wretched individual that was full of sin and showed mercy on us by giving us Jesus. And those of us that put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we were saved. So Paul says, in view of those great mercies, let your love be sincere. In fact, let's pick it up in verse nine. He says, let love be sincere, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. And jump down to verse 17, he says this, do not repay anyone evil for evil and be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath for it's written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, Paul says, in light of God's mercies, (laughs) in light of all he's done through Jesus Christ, we should love one another, right? We should love one another. And then he moves on, but what about those people? that you just don't wanna love, (laughs) right? You have any of those? You're thinking of somebody right now because the holidays are coming, right? They're gonna be in your house in a few weeks or you're gonna be in their house. Get the picture here, look at this. This this just breaks down everything on the screen. I wanna show this to you. In verse nine, he says, it's a love be genuine. In verse 10, love one another with brotherly uh, brotherly affection. In verse 14, he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Repay no evil for evil. If possible, live with peace, peaceably with all. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. In verse 20, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In verse 21, overcome evil with good. You see, the clear message here is that we should love our enemies, right? And this love involves treating people better than they deserve. Not returning evil for evil, but blessing them from your heart. I think that's why Paul said, hey, love one another with a sincere heart. Don't be hypocrites about it. Love each other. Let's be honest. It's easy to believe that. The only remedy to our anger is to get revenge, isn't it? And maybe you're not like me. This is something I've struggled with all my life. It's easier to believe that the only remedy to someone that's hurt me is to get them back, right? To pay them back. Somebody cuts me off in traffic, I'm gonna go cut them off, right? Somebody tailgates me, I'm gonna slow down. Come on. Somebody's going too slow, I'm gonna get right up on their bumper before I pass them. I'm not gonna give a run for it. You know what I'm saying, come on brother, you laughing, thank you. Got one guy in here going, dude, I so get that. See, we, we have to settle the debt, don't we? What other option is there? I mean, even if there was some way other than around the debt, it wouldn't be fair, right? Because look what they did to me. Look what they took from me. And if I settle the debt, then that's not fair. I mean, people need to pay what they owe, right? To cancel the debt is to let them off the hook. And that's not fair. And by the way, the whole world depends on me. If I don't get them back, then they're going to go and do that to somebody else, right? Anybody else think that? The irony is that most cases, the perceived debt can never be paid back. You see, if you really want to get down to the truth of the matter, how do you pay back a 25-year-old or a 50-year-old son or daughter for something that was done to them when they were 12? You can't. It can't be done. You know, it's an irony, but it's actually a tragedy. It's tragic because people spend much of their lives waiting for debts to be paid that cannot be paid. 
Most people spend the rest of their lives waiting for a debt to be paid that can never be paid. And in most cases, it intensifies and it spreads to other relationships. And I found that if anger lodged in my heart, then before long, I believe that everybody will owe me. I was getting to a point that I believe everybody owes me something and I become very difficult to live with. And we know those kind of people, don't we? They're those kind of people that we call angry people. We're the, they're those kind of people that it seems like they're angry all the time and just about at everybody. It's their demeanor. And their wrath isn't just reserved for the offending party. It's really reserved for anyone because they're equal opportunity avengers. You ever been around someone like that? It seems like they're always angry. And the closer you get, the more likely it is that you're gonna get dumped on. And you don't even see it coming. So it brings me to a question this morning. After looking at that passage in Romans chapter 12, how long are you going to allow the people who have hurt you to control your life? Another year? Another chapter? Another six months? How long? You see, the reason that questioning is so frustrating is because many of us naively believe that we don't have a choice in the matter. We've got to get them back. We've got to get revenge. We've got to level the playing field. And while it's true you can't undo what's been done, it's equally true that you don't have to let the past control your future. But you gotta decide, do you wanna be free? You gotta decide, am I gonna quit using my story as an excuse? I asked a man this last week, I said, do you wanna be free? Do you? You see, that's a question you gotta ask, is do you wanna be free? You see, for many of us in this room, our story explains our behavior but it doesn't excuse it. Let me say that again. Your story explains your behavior, but it doesn't excuse it. I mean, justifying your behavior by reciting your story gives ongoing power to the people who hurt you. Some of you go way back and you continue to tell that story over and over and over again. And you're given those people in your life that took something from you that you thought you deserved, that you thought you were owed, and you're giving them leverage in your life. And some of you see your anger and your thirst for revenge as an asset, as an ally. I mean, come on, you've learned that you can leverage your anger in certain ways. My wife calls it bullying. That we can leverage that and sometimes it's really good because your anger and your passion and those things that you're passionate about, you can leverage at the right times and it can be a great ally. But for most of us, you believe your anger makes you strong, makes you a better leader, a more effective disciplinarian, even a successful coach. I've seen coaches that get so angry and they think that's what makes them a great coach, but it doesn't make you more effective or successful. And it certainly doesn't make you stronger. In fact, the people who are forced to interact with you see it as a weakness and even a sickness because anger and unforgiveness really alienates people. And more times than we care to admit, think about this, the shrapnel of our anger pierces those closest to us when out of nowhere we explode. For years, I struggled with this. For years, the anger would well up in me And I was a really easygoing guy until you said something or took something that I thought I deserved. And then it would blow up and it would detonate. And unfortunately, in most cases, it was my unsuspecting friends and my family that that caught the shrapnel, that caught some of that. Let's go back to Romans chapter 12. I want you to see it again. And I want you to look what Paul said. And before you write Paul off as some guy that's out of touch, look what he says. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in in the eyes of everyone. Be careful, he says. You can't do it, but be careful that you do. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And by the way, we're going to look at how you can do that next week. So come back, all right? Just a little preview. You don't want to miss next week. But live at peace with everyone. Verse 19, don't, don't take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Let that sit for a minute. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you're going to heat burning coals on his head. Don't overcome evil. Don't be overcome by evil, he says, but overcome evil with good. With good. So what do you do 
for those people that offend you. I think what Paul's saying, just in summary, is forgive them. <laughs> Almost sounds too simple, doesn't it? Just forgive them. Before you write the Apostle Paul off as some pious religious figure that has no idea what's going on and that he wasn't sitting on some white beach in Tahiti writing on his Apple laptop about forgiveness, you need to understand where Paul wrote most of his letters. And where Paul wrote most of his letters was not on some beach. It was in a prison cell. For many times he was arrested unjustly. He was extradited to Rome, beaten, almost killed, waited for trial more than a year at one point. To make writers worse, you think our political climate is rough? The political climate of Rome and in that day was even worse and, and not even favorable to Christians. This new cult called the Way was viewed with suspicion by the populace as well as the leadership. And so here's Paul, in spite of all these ideal circumstances, Paul is writing here to the Roman church and he's basically instructing the believers to rid themselves of any traces of bitterness and anger. Look at that list again from all those verses. He says, look, man, let your love be genuine. Love one another. He's not sitting on a beach. Remember, he's in a cell. He's sitting somewhere where he's being persecuted. And he says, look, man, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Don't repent evil for evil and if possible live at peace with everybody hello <laughs> never avenge yourselves notice he says never avenge yourselves just gets harder and harder doesn't it leave it to the wrath of God and if your enemy's hungry feed him if he's thirsty give him something to drink overcome evil with good is that even possible Paul thinks so and listen he doesn't qualify his words he doesn't give any of us an out or even a point to extreme circumstances of what happened to me when I was 12, or what happened to me when I was in college, or what happened to me in that first, second, and third marriage. He doesn't give us an out. What if he's right? What if, what if he's right that we can be genuine, that we can love each other, that we really can bless those who persecute us, that we don't repay evil for evil, that is there a way we can live peaceably with all and, and can we read room for God and feed those and serve those that are our enemies? Is there a way? See, I know this doesn't sound easy because perhaps you've been there. Maybe you've tried to forgive. And see, anytime I talk about forgiveness, there's basically three groups. There are, there's those groups of people in this room and you may be here this morning and maybe listening to me and you may say, you know what? I know I ought to forgive, but I just can't. I can't muster up the courage and that may be where you are this morning, or you may be in this second group that to let the offender off the hook is just not right. My pastor growing up used to say, you're on my delayed forgiveness list. I'm going to forgive you, but I'm going to delay it as long as I possibly can. How many are there this morning? Don't raise your hands. Don't look at your spouse. Don't look at your kids. Amen. See, that's kind of where we are, aren't we? I mean, if I forgive them, I'm letting them off the hook. And that's not fair. See, the third group, you may be sitting here this morning and go, you know, I've gone through this, Edward. But those feelings and those memories keep coming back. And I just wonder, can I really forgive them? You see, fortunately, Jesus tackled this issue of forgiveness head on during his days. When Jesus was walking the earth, there was this one disciple. It's one of my favorite disciples. His name is Peter. In Matthew chapter 18, Peter comes to Jesus, and he's wrestling with this whole idea of forgiveness. And so he asked Jesus this question. He said, Jesus. He came to Jesus. Matthew 18, 21. Look at it. He said, then, then Peter came to Jesus, and he asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or my sister who sins against me? And he takes a wild guess. Up to seven times. In other words, when is enough enough? Because we all want to know that, right? When is enough enough? If I get one question when it comes to marriage counseling, is when is enough enough? Can I leave him? Can I leave her? Can I get out of this? Peter here is coming to this and he's going, man, I really want to do the right thing. But tell me how many boxes I have to check before I'm off the hook, right? Where's the justice in a system where forgiveness is always offered? <laughs> And Peter takes a stab, seven. Can I do seven? Because I'm on six right now. If you just let me have permission for seven, I'm done. And you see, I think Peter, like us, assumes that forgiveness is for the offender. We assume that forgiveness is all about the one who's hurt us. And, and I believe that like many of us, we're willing to stretch just a little bit like Peter. Okay, I'll do it once. Okay, uh, you know, do it once. Shame on you. Do it twice. Shame on me. You know, we have all those sayings. 
But there's something in us that says forgiveness has its limits. At some predetermined point, no more. I'm not going to take it anymore. We're not going to take it. Right? That's for all you 80s people. I have a feeling Jesus just looked at Peter and he smiled in verse 22. He says this, I'll tell you, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And before Peter could respond, before anybody else could say anything, he goes into this story in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began to settle, as it began to settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt. Don't miss those three words. He canceled the debt and let him go. You know, Jesus told this story, and I know everybody was sitting there was going, oh, yeah, man, that is so good. Simply put, forgiveness is a decision to cancel the debt, and it's so practical that no one there missed it. If you were listening to that story, when Jesus was telling that story, everybody's like going, holy cow, how could I ever pay that back? Because here this guy was, he was about to lose everything, his servant, his wife, his children, everything he owed. And he owed enough money that he would never be able to make it in his entire lifetime. It could never be paid back. And he goes and he appeals to his master and his pastor has mercy on him and he forgives him and cancels the debt. <laughs> Took pity on him. And that's the essence of forgiveness. Cancel the debt. I know some of you are still wrestling with that. So let's read on, verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. So let, let me give you the idea. This guy owed 10,000 talents, okay? And that was an enormous amount of money. He could never make that amount of money in a lifetime. So now he's been forgiven the debt, right? And he goes to his friend, his buddy, who owes him a hundred silver coins. Doesn't even compare. All right. So he owed him 100 silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. <laughs> Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. So here's the forgiven servant going to somebody that owes them even a smaller amount, an amount that would probably only take him a few months to be able to repay back. And the guy does not have mercy on him, grabs him Homer Simpson style, begins to choke him and demanding his money back. I mean, you would expect this guy who had that massive debt to think something little. Verse 30, he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Why well, do you pay a debt in prison, right? You don't. And when the other servants saw what was going on, they were outraged. They went and told their master everything that would happen. In verse 32, then the master called the servant in. Remember, Jesus is telling this story and there's no commentary. He's just walking through this story says, then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all of that debt. There it is again of yours. And there Jesus gives that decision again. Forgiveness is simple, canceled debt. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And you know, everybody was listening going, yeah, you know, that's right. You know what? Because you hear that story, you're going, yeah. And verse 34 in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And rightly so, right? Anybody's going to be that ungrateful. That's what they need to happen. And this wasn't an extraordinary punishment. It's just a simple matter of holding someone accountable here in the story. He owed what he should have paid. And then he wasn't merciful. So his servant comes back and goes, all right, bud, you're going to be that way? But that next statement that Jesus says in verse 35 Look at that. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Amen. <laughs> wow. Uh, let me connect the dots. Because you see the king in the story represents God. That servant who had all of their debts canceled represents us. Huh. 
And that second service is anybody in your life that you're holding on to. Man. They've offended us, though. They've taken something from us. They've hurt us. These people owe us. And yet here's Jesus' response. Cancel the debt. (laughs) Forgive them or else. And see, that's what we don't like, isn't it? The or else. I mean, what a terrible thing to say to someone that's been taken advantage of. What are you thinking, Jesus? And maybe you're giving Jesus a pass and you're just gonna transfer that onto me. What are you thinking, preacher? Do you understand what they've happened? (laughs) I'm a victim. And you're asking me and you're telling me that if I don't grant them forgiveness, which they don't deserve, then God's coming after me too? What is up with that? I know. (laughs) I mean, obviously it was a clear and stern warning from Jesus warning those of us who refuse to forgive. And and Peter had his answer. You know what the answer was to Jesus, to Peter's original question? You you ready ready for this? Forgive every time. I know, I know. Because if you don't, you're gonna pay dearly. And perhaps Peter saw the irony, maybe not. I mean, look at the screen because I wanna show you this. I want you to see this. You see, here's what will happen if you don't forgive. If we hold out waiting to be paid back for the wrongs done to us, we will be the ones who pay. If, on the other hand, we cancel the debts. Would you just say those three words with me? Cancel the debt. Say it again. Cancel the debt owed to you. You'll be free. You'll be free. And I know some of you are sitting here and you're just, everything in your being right now is, is welling up in you. So look at this. I want you to see this. I wanted to put this on the, sc- on the screen because you need to understand that, uh, hang on just a second. You need to understand, I didn't get this on the screen. From our perspective, we have every right to hold out until we're paid back, don't we? We have, we have every right, but from God's perspective, it's possibly the most self-destructive thing we can do. It's possibly the most destructive thing that we can do. And there may be a lot of you in this room that you're in prison that you've given ground to somebody. You've given, you've given them a place in your life and it's been years. Maybe it was yesterday you gave them a place. Maybe it was just a few days ago, but you keep reliving that story. And perhaps what Jesus had in mind when he gave such a stern warning, if we demand payment, we're gonna pay. That we're gonna be the ones suffer the consequences. For so many of us in this room, the people that you're mad at have gone on with their life. I received a phone call about seven years ago for something that happened back in 2004. And I was on the phone with this person and this person, we were having this conversation and finally they said, can I ask you something? And they relived this whole story of happened back in 2004. And they said this, we, we, we have so worried that you think that we are this and we don't want you to think about this. And there's not a day that goes by that we didn't want you to worry about this or you to be thinking about this. And I can remember sitting on the phone with them going, I don't even remember what they're talking about. <laughs> Some of you are holding on to stuff that if you probably went and talked to that person who think they owe you, they're gonna probably look at you and go, I don't really have any idea what you're talking about. See, if your experience with anger is anything like mine, then you know that Jesus' warning is not exaggerated. And it's exactly what we should expect from Jesus who came to earth to rescue us from sin. Listen to me, look at this statement, this is good. Your pain isn't a trophy to show off and yet so many of us do, don't we? We show off our pain. We, we can't sit down and have a conversation. Thanksgiving's coming. You're already reliving your story. You're already getting ready to tell the crazy uncle, the crazy aunt, or to listen to the crazy uncle or the crazy aunt. Amen? Listen, your story isn't a trophy to show off. It's not a story to tell. It's potentially poison to your soul. To refuse to forgive is to choose to self-destruct. To self-destruct. And listen, if you're a Christian... You aren't expected to treat others 
the way you've been treated by others. You've been called to treat people the same way you've been treated by the Father. In view of God's mercy, as Paul said, in view of all that God has done, and treat others the way you've been treated. See, you don't forgive because the other person deserves it. You forgive because you've been forgiven. You don't forgive because the other person deserves it. You forgive because you have been forgiven. And that doesn't mean it's something that you immediately feel like doing or want to do. I got to be honest with you, there's not been many times when I've forgiven someone that there's this overwhelming feeling in me going, you know what, I just can't wait to forgive them. (laughs) Amen? I mean, I'm telling you, it's just something in you that rises up that you push back on it. You see, forgiveness is a gift we decide to give in spite of how we feel. My wife says feelings are like gas, they pass. (laughs) She'll be here at the next service, she'll love that. You see, here's what I say, feelings come and go. They come and they go, but the decision remains. They don't owe you. She doesn't owe you. He doesn't owe you. See, listen, your memories, look at this statement. Your memories are not your enemies. Memories are simply memories. What you do with them will determine the impact. Your memories are not your enemies. Some of you have some memories, man, you can never live down and you'll never forget. But listen, they're not your enemies. They're simply memories. It's what you do with them that determines their impact. You see, forgiveness doesn't always entail truly forgetting. We're gonna talk about this next week, so come back. It's tempting, of course, to judge whether or not you've forgiven by how you feel toward the offender because you have so many memories about that event. But your feelings towards someone is not an accurate gauge for you to base your behavior on. In fact, your feelings are generally the last thing to come around. But in time, if Paul is right, in time, if Paul, his admonition to us, is not to get even, then your feelings will change. But blaming won't make it better. Holding on for an apology won't either. The cure is forgiveness. In view of God's mercies, don't treat others the way you've been treated. But in view of God's mercies, treat others the way God's treated you. So so here's your assignment this week. Here's your assignment. I know some of you are looking at me and we're digging around in the heart again and some of you are pushing back on this and you're thinking, I don't know about this, Edward. And I, I, that Paul guy, he had to be sitting on a Mediterranean beach somewhere when he wrote this. He's just out of touch. Okay, all right. So let, let me do this. After this is over, I want you to get up enough courage to ask your family and friends. I want you to ask them if you have an anger issue. Okay? I, I know. Some of you are like, hey, no way. Then you need to. All right? Let me say that. If you're sitting there right now going, hey, no way, you need to, okay? So today after this over, I want you to ask your friends and as they respond, I want you to listen to two things. You ready for this? Number one, listen to what they're saying, but more importantly, listen to what you're feeling. Chances are, <laughs> some of you already, your heart's already stirred, okay? <laughs> But chances are, as they respond, and I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen is, they're gonna respond very tenderly. And that ought to tell you something, okay? Their words are gonna stir your heart. And when they're stirred, we're gonna become most aware aware of what our hearts contain, okay? But here's the real test. If while they're treading ever so slowly out to perceive down this very thin ice that you go, well, you know, baby, and well, you know, honey, and as they're just kind of walking out there, if you feel like there's a volcano rising up in you, listen to that. Or how about this one? If while they're making their case, you feel compelled to interrupt, I'm sorry, I mean, uh, to defend yourself. Can I just tell you, that is me. Can I just be honest with you? There's something in me that if I'm not careful, I'll forget everything Paul said in Romans chapter 12. And when someone comes to me, I will interrupt. But, but, anybody else with me? And I don't thank you, one. Anybody else want to join in this? Yeah. 
Okay, so if while they're making their case, you feel compelled to interrupt or defend or explain yourself, that ought to tell you something. If you find yourself wanting to just pack your bags and get out of the room, if you find yourself getting angry, then yeah, more than likely, there's something underneath there that you feel like you're owed something. And it may not be your loved one, it may go way back. Listen, don't be discouraged. I'm telling you, don't be discouraged. You're in good company. In fact, look around the room. You're in great company, amen? You see, I would love to think I'm the only one that struggled in this area. You see, I've struggled with it for most of my adult life. And while today I'm good, okay, I'll be home at about one. I may not be, that's right. <laughs> Don't be discouraged. Because see, a discovery that could very well set you on your way towards a healthy heart could be coming. But like all internal enemies, anger gains its strength from secrecy. The power of a stronghold is the fact that it remains a secret. And can I just say something to you? Most of the people close to you, it's not a secret to that's why they walk on eggshells. That's why they're almost, listen, dad's okay. Just let dad have a few minutes. I, I, let mama have her moment, right? Am I wrong? You see, exposing it is painful and yet powerful at the same time. Four and a half years ago, when my counselor looked at me and said, you're a bully. And my wife went, <clears throat> amen. <laughs> it hurts. But there's power in that. Because a power comes when you're carrying that heart full of anger. And see, for me, my anger wasn't something that exploded all the time. It was just like every two or three years. For some of you, your anger never explodes. It's just seething underneath because you feel cheated. And chances are, your family's been praying. Your boss has been praying that something would happen that would set you free. And so we go back to Romans chapter 12 as we land today. And I'm going to leave you with this assignment that maybe, just maybe, some of you will have the courage to go home and ask. <laughs> some of you may not. Go ask your parents, teens. Just ask your mom and daddy if you've got an anger problem. <laughs> in view of God's mercy, forgive those, love those who hurt you intentionally and unintentionally. Don't repay them. Leave room for God to work. See, that, that's that passage where it says, heap coals on them that give God time to work in them. You know the prayer my wife prayed for me for years? God, change him or change me. Instead of taking revenge on me, she just prayed that prayer, God, change him or change me. Change him or change me. And listen, you may be new to Summit and you're not used to the holy man up here talking this way. Welcome to Summit, okay? I, I don't have anything to hide. I have enough margin in my life I'm still working on, amen? amen? And see, here's what I know the truth, so do you. So let's just get real. That maybe, just maybe, you give room for God to work. And as far as it depends on you, let's live at peace with those around us. And next week, we're going to look at that. Because I know what some of you are thinking, that's impossible, right? How do you live? Because there's somebody in your journey that it doesn't matter if you gave them a million dollars, they would cuss you. Amen? So how do I do that? Come back next week. Amen? Would you have courage to ask that question this week? That's your assignment. That's it. Nothing else. You don't have to come to the front. We're not going to sing Kumbaya for the next 30 minutes. It's just a challenge in view of God's mercies. Would you have the courage to maybe ask your spouse on the way home? You might want to wait till five today. I don't know what time the Cowboys play and don't care. Okay. But at some point, maybe tomorrow, you would just be bold enough and maybe not your spouse, maybe your friend that you're really close to. Do I have an anger problem? And listen, listen to what your heart says. 
Because if it's a volcano or you're interrupting or you want to get out of the room and you want to run, then there's probably a truth. See, Jesus just simply said this, cancel the debt. Cancel the debt. Let them off the hook. Let them off the hook. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that Paul could walk through 11 chapters of theology that would make our heads spin. And God, wrap it all up in view of God's mercies. God, you are a merciful God that responded to our sin, responded to our situation of our separation from you. And God, you sent Jesus to die on the cross, not just for the Jews, not just for the whole world, so that we may be made right with you, redeemed and reconciled, that through a repentant heart that we confess our sins and we surrender our life to you. And God, in view of all of that, that we would treat others the same way. So God, give us courage. But some will take this homework this week. God, help them listen. And God, as you begin to stir their heart, I pray you'd give them repentance and the courage to let them off the hook. Cancel the debt, just as you canceled our debt through Jesus Christ. So God, I love you. We ask it in your name. Everybody said, have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.